at Egypt. That transitional period. Salah, come back. Can you elaborate on the concrete steps that you want to see undertaken in Egypt? Well, we want, yeah, it, it, you know, the process has to be inclusive. It has to open up uh, real space for uh, political and economic re reform, uh, you know, to happen. It has to be inclusive in bringing in a from national dialogue. Thank you, Mr. President. I ask you uh, consent. You, know, political opposition, you can see the rest of this briefing on C-SPAN.org. We return you to the U.S. Senate, the floor of the U.S. Senate. I may uh, speak for as much time uh, as I consume. Without objection, so ordered. Uh, under the previous order, the leadership time is reserved. Under the previous order, there will be a period of morning business with senators permitted to speak therein for up to 10 minutes each. Subject, Mr. President, to the consent request that I asked a moment ago to exceed the 10-minute limit, uh, 10 minute limit. The senator is correct. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Mr. President, as some of us predicted, problems are already arising from the Senate's ratification of the New START Treaty last December. The Russians just ratified it, and their interpretation of its meaning and obligation is different from ours. That's going to cause problems. I will also discuss uh, this afternoon the President's fiscal year 2012 budget in the areas of nuclear modernization and missile defense, both of which were closely tied to the Senate's support of the New START Treaty. First, what the Russians are saying about the treaty. The Russian State Duma and the Federation Council, which is their counterpart to the Senate, last week passed its federal law on the New START Treaty, and that's the Russian equivalent to our resolution of ratification. That document demonstrates that there is a significant divergence of views between the two countries on several key provisions and core principles of the New START Treaty. For example, Russian officials continue to assert, despite statements from the Obama administration and despite the Senate's legally binding positions to the contrary, that various treaty provisions, including in the preamble, constrain U.S. military options regarding missile defense and conventional prompt global strike. Far from supporting the touted reset in its relations, this lack of meeting of the minds is a ticking time bomb for disruption of our relations. First, regarding missile defense. The Senate unanimously adopted an amendment to the resolution of ratification, providing that the New START preamble does not impose a legal obligation on the parties. The Senate's principal concern and rationale for this provision was the language in the preamble linking offensive forces to missile defenses, a clear attempt by the Russians to foreclose future qualitative and quantitative improvements to U.S. missile defense uh, capabilities. Contrary to the U.S. position, Russian officials have recently declared that the preamble is an integral part of the treaty and is thus binding on the parties. Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov has stated, and I'm quoting here, there are a few problems, one of the main ones being the assertion contained in the Senate floor statement that the correlation between the strategic offensive and defensive weapons reflected in the treaty is not legally binding for the U.S. and Russia because it is stipulated in the preamble. This thesis, he says, cannot be defended by lawyers." End of quote. Contradicting President Obama's December 18 letter on missile defense to Senators Reid and McConnell and the Senate's resolution of ratification, Foreign Minister Lavrov further contends, and I'm quoting, that the content of the treaty unequivocally points to the correlation between strategic offensive weapons and missile defense. It is set out in the preamble, whereas the text of the treaty contains an article that allows either party to withdraw in the event of an emergency. We are convinced that the implementation of the full-scale global missile defense by the U.S. will be precisely such an emergency. End of quotation. Mr. President, these statements stand in apparent contradiction to the resolution of ratification adopted by the Senate. On the point concerning the legality of the preamble, which includes the unfortunate linkage between offensive uh, arms and missile defense, the Russian federal law on the New START ratification highlights the importance that Russia attaches to the preamble and this linkage between missile defense and strategic offensive arms. And it introduces a new issue, the possibility of understandings between the party not revealed to the U.S. Senate. Here's what Article 4, Paragraph 1 of the Russian 
law says, quote, the provisions of the preamble of the New START Treaty shall have indisputable significance for the understanding of the party's intentions upon its signature, including the content of the terms agreed to between them and the understandings without which the New START Treaty would not have been concluded. In this connection, they must be considered in toto by the parties in the course of implementing the New START Treaty." End of quote. Because of these terms and understandings, Article 4 goes on to state that the Russian Federation shall exercise its right to withdraw from the treaty in the case of extraordinary events, including, and I'm quoting now, the deployment by the United States of America, another group, or a group of states of a missile defense system capable of significantly reducing the effectiveness of the Russian Federation's strategic nuclear forces. End of quote. So now the Russian parliament is clearly on record that the deployment of U.S. national missile defenses or missile defense deployments in conjunction with our NATO allies could be cause for Russian withdrawal from the treaty. Since Russia opposed the deployment of 10 ground-based interceptors in Poland, it is likely to oppose as well the planned deployment of land-based SM-3 missiles in Romania and Poland capable of intercepting Iranian ICBMs. This provision in the Russian law is fundamentally incompatible with the U.S. understanding of the treaty and with current U.S. plans to deploy these missile defenses in Europe and to modernize U.S. national missile defenses as the President affirmed to us in his December 18th letter. The administration should immediately work to resolve this dispute with the Russians. Otherwise, the U.S. would be willfully perpetrating a future collision course between Russia and the United States. I'm sending a letter to Assistant Secretary of State Rose Gottmiller, which raises this issue and asks for clarification of the assertion that there were understandings between the negotiators not reflected in the public record. The President will have to decide whether to exchange the instruments of ratification with the Russian Federation with this discrepancy extant and the others that I'll briefly touch on. I'm not aware of a bilateral treaty that has entered into force where such a divergence of views existed. Perhaps there's clarification on these matters in some secret cable or in another part of the classified negotiating record. The administration's stubborn refusal to share these materials with the Senate has denied senators the answer. Part of the Corker-Lieberman amendment to the treaty also requires the administration to communicate to Russia at the time of the exchange of instruments of ratification that it is the policy of the United States to continue development and deployment of U.S. missile defense systems, including qualitative and quantitative improvements to such systems. I urge the administration to consult with the Senate to ensure that our intent is accurately conveyed before exchanging this policy statement and the instruments of ratification. Now, the resolution of ratification also makes clear that missile defense will not be on the table in any future treaty. Understanding number one makes clear that no limits on U.S. missile defenses can be achieved through the New START Treaty, including the bilateral consultative commission which it creates without the advice and consent of the Senate, which if I have anything to say about it will not be forthcoming. There is also Declaration Number 1, which states, that, and I'm quoting, further limitations on the missile defense capabilities of the United States are not in the national security interest of the United States, end of quote. And the Lemieux Amendment, which made it the policy of the United States not to include defensive missile systems in any negotiations with Russia on tactical nuclear weapons. Now, the administration might have created the impression with Russia that the United States would discuss missile defense, whether in the tauscher Ribikov track of secretive side negotiations, the full extent of which the administration is hiding from Congress, or by agreeing to the preamble language or Article 5, Section 3, in contravention of, contravention of Section uh, uh, tw uh, 1251 of the uh, fiscal year 2010 Defense Authorization Bill. Without, or excuse me, with regard to Under Secretary Tauscher's side negotiations, I note that the Russians know more about the U.S. position in these negotiations than the U.S. Senate does, which brings to mind again Article 4 of the Russian Federal Law on Ratification, which state that, and quoting again, the, pre, the provisions of the preamble of the New START Treaty 
shall have indisputable significance for the understanding of the parties' intentions, including the content of the terms agreed between them and the understandings without which the New START Treaty would not have been concluded. End of quote. What understandings are these? Is this referring to something beyond the text of the treaty and the preamble? Unfortunately, the Senate is unaware of such understandings because we've been denied access to the negotiating record. There is the potential here for a major confrontation between the Senate and the administration if the administration does not immediately make a full disclosure to the Senate on these matters. The Senate's action in the resolution of ratification should also make clear that it will not accept any further linkage between offensive nuclear reductions. I'm pleased to note a recent product of the Arms Control Association, it's called Strategic Missile Defense, a Threat to Future Nuclear Arms Reductions, that seems to agree with my point. In its recent analysis, this group correctly observed that the United States will continue to require exempting strategic missile defense from treaties. And while the Arms Control Association seems to believe this is a mistake, I'm pleased that the Senate sent a message so unmistakable that even the arms control community comprehended it. The administration will have an opportunity to prove whether its statements of support for missile defense, including the President's December 18th letter, were mere rhetoric or actual policy, beginning when it submits the fiscal year 12 budget request. Initial press reports hint that the Defense Department is anticipating yet another reduction in funding for missile defense programs over the next five years, despite funding plans that are already about $4 billion below what was envisioned by the last administration for the fiscal years 2010 through 2013. This is inconceivable, given the funding shortfalls increasingly apparent in the President's own plans for improving U.S. missile defenses, as well as four phases of the phased adaptive approach to missile defense in Europe. It appears that elements of the administration's phased adaptive approach for missile defense are already falling behind, and the President's budgets for missile defense have almost guaranteed the atrophy and obsolescence of the only national missile defense system that we now have. If these reports are accurate, it would belie the President's commitment to missile defense, which was central to Senate support for the New START Treaty, and suggest the Senate was misled during its consideration of the treaty. Now, with regard to conventional prompt global strike, remember this is the concept where U.S. intercontinental range missiles could substitute a conventional warhead for a nuclear warhead for prompt delivery to a place far away on the globe uh, in a time of emergency. Senators' concerns uh, were not limited to missile defense, as I said. We also talked about this prompt global strike uh, uh, issue in the connection with the START Treaty. Referencing this capability, Foreign Minister Lavrov told the Russian Duma, and I quote, the U.S. Senate's resolution claims that the treaty does not apply to new kinds of non-nuclear strategic weapons that could be developed in the future, but this is not true, end of quote. And then he also stated, and I'm quoting, we find unacceptable the unilateral American interpretation of the treaty according to which future strategic range systems with non-nuclear warheads not meeting the parameters stated in the treaty, shall not be regarded as new types of strategic offensive weapons covered by the treaty." End of quote. Likewise, federal, uh, Russian federal law states in Article 2, Paragraph 7, that the question of the applicability of the provisions of the New START Treaty to any kind of new, any new kind of strategic range offensive arms should be resolved within the framework of the Bilateral Consultative Commission prior to the deployment of such new kind of strategic range offensive arms." End of quote. Hence, Russia is rejecting the U.S. understanding on strategic range non-nuclear weapon systems contained in the Senate's resolution of ratification, which states, and I quote, nothing in the new START treaty prohibits deployments of strategic range non-nuclear weapon systems. End of quote. In other words, conventional prompt global strike. The President must make this fact plain to both Russia and the Senate when he provides the report on the prompt global strike systems to the Senate prior to entry into force of the treaty. It mocks the very idea of a U.S.-Russian arms control pact if such a disagreement, Russia's rejection of a formally adopted U.S. understanding, is allowed to stand. Now let me mention telemetry. 
In response to senators who raised concerns about the inadequacy of the verification and telemetry provisions in New START, the administration essentially said not to worry. The treaty permits each side to exchange telemetry on up to five tests per year. Well, as could have been expected when the administration capitulated to Russian demands concerning telemetry, the Russian federal law now prohibits, quote, providing to the United States of America telemetric information about the launches of new types of intercontinental ballistic missiles and submarine ballistic missiles, end of quote. This is exactly what treaty opponents predicted. As a result, we will know less about new Russian systems than under the previous START verification regime. At the very least, Russia's action in its federal law to deny the U.S. telemetry on this future, future missile development will place greater burdens on our national technical means to monitor the development of new Russian ballistic missiles. The denial of telemetry from new missile delivery systems poses a material risk by aiding Russia's potential for breakout from the treaty limits, which of course is a central concern of the Senate in conditions number two and number four of the resolution of ratification. Finally, the Russian foreign minister seems to have taken aim at the Senate's condition that negotiations begin within a year to address the disparity in tactical nuclear weapons between Russia and the United States. In noting the imbalance in conventional forces, plans to deploy weapons in space, and U.S. global missile defense plans, Russian Minister Lavrov stated, and I quote, it is possible to hold future negotiations only with due account of all these factors and after the fulfillment of the new start, end of quote. Clearly, Russia is not interested in beginning such negotiations anytime soon. The foreign minister has proven correct those senators who cautioned that after this treaty was ratified, the U.S. would lose whatever leverage it had to address non-strategic nuclear weapons. Assistant Secretary Gottmiller appears to take seriously the Senate's instruction in this regard, even referring to it as her marching orders. I trust she views equally the Senate's marching orders that a subsequent treaty not deal with U.S. missile defenses. Mr. President, I am not aware of an example when the United States has ratified a bilateral treaty in the face of clear evidence that there is no meeting of the minds on key treaty terms. While New START was under Senate consideration, administration officials continually spoke about how critical the treaty was to reset relations with Russia and how the completed treaty manifested improved relations between the two countries. This can be the case, however, only if the parties actually agree on the fundamentals of the treaty's meaning. Now let me speak to the uh, anticipated 2012 budget for nuclear modernization. The Senate, in Condition 9 of the resolution, linked its support for the New START Treaty on a clear commitment to ensuring the safety, reliability, and performance of its nuclear forces. This commitment requires full funding to ensure a robust stockpile stewardship program, a modernization nuclear weapons production capability, and the development of new nuclear delivery systems to replace the aging nuclear triad of bombers, submarines, and ICBMs. If in a given year funding fails to meet the 10-year plan or required levels of resources are greater than the 10-year plan, the President is conditioned by or required by Condition 9 to submit a report on how the administration will remedy the shortfall, the project requiring funds and the level is required, the impact of the shortfall on nuclear readiness, and whether it is in the national interest to remain a party to the treaty. We must codify the requirement to provide an annual update to Section 1251, requiring the administration to annually provide an updated assessment of the levels of funding required to maintain and modernize the stockpile. And the administration has agreed that this is necessary. As it currently stands, the administration's proposed 10-year budget for nuclear weapons activities, as promised in the update to the Section 1251 report, takes a critical first step toward nuclear weapons sustainment and modernization. It proposes an $85 billion budget for weapons activities over 10 years from 2011 through 2020 and describes the critical near-term requirements of at least $7 billion in 2011 and $7.6 billion in 2012. To be successful, the modernization program must have the complete backing of the President, 
the Armed Services Committees and the Appropriation Committees, as well as the full House and Senate. These budget requests will allow the laboratories and plants responsible for nuclear weapons to begin a slow recovery from the neglect that has been crippling their ability to address real issues as our current stockpile ages. The administration must, however, continue to review and revise its estimates for the modernization program and follow through on its commitments to obtain this funding from the Congress. This modernization program must address the past, the present, and the future of our nuclear weapon complex. For example, the stockpile surveillance program evaluates the current condition of our aging nuclear weapon stockpile. This program has been seriously underfunded in recent years, resulting in a decreased confidence in our nuclear weapons. This isn't my assessment, but rather the assessment of some of the premier authorities on nuclear weapons, the directors of the nuclear weapons laboratories. It is likewise the conclusion of the Bipartisan Congressional Commission on the U.S. Strategic Posture. Likewise, budget requests must allow for the continuation of current life extension programs, including the W-76, which is currently in production. The B-61, which is rapidly nearing its end of life, but continues to be required for both strategic and tactical roles. And the W-78, which will require very extensive and challenging life extension to correct aging issues and incorporate higher standards for safety and security. These three planned programs will not likely be completed until the end of the 2020 decade. As it stands, there does not appear to be capacity in the complex to insert the long-range strike option warhead production in the next decade, which will be needed to replace our current W-80 warheads and air-launched cruise missiles. We are the only nuclear weapon state without a nuclear weapon production capability. Restoring the health of our current weapons is critically important. Finally, the balanced program must prepare us for the future by improving the quality of our facilities many of which are Cold War and even Manhattan Project era facilities. Design and engineering development of the chemistry and metallurgy research replacement nuclear facility and the uranium processing facility should be accelerated to the extent possible. Construction estimates should be properly evaluated and completion of these facilities should be aggressively pursued for their completion by 2020. This is another so-called marching order for the administration. It's difficult to overstate the importance of these facilities to our future national security. The opportunity exists to push these programs forward. For example, the recent exchange of letters between the Senate appropriation leaders and the President shows that the commitment must be bipartisan and must include both Congress and the administration. Notably, the Senate Appropriations Committee leaders, Senators Inouye and Cochran, and the Energy and Water Subcommittee leaders, Senator Feinstein and Alexander, stated on December 16, 2010, and I quote, that funding for our nuclear modernization in the nuclear, National Nuclear Security Agency's proposed budgets should be considered defense spending as it is critical to national security. And they state, this represents a long-term commitment by each of us as modernization of our nuclear arsenal will require a sustained effort, end of quote. The President responded on December 20, 2010 with a commitment to support the $85 billion budget, and he also committed to an annual update to the Section 1251 report. And here's what he said, I recognize that nuclear modernization requires investment for the long term, in addition to this one-year budget increase. That is my commitment to Congress, end of quote. It must be our commitment to hold the President to his word and to be likewise, and likewise to provide our full support for nuclear weapon modernization. Finally, Mr. President, <clears throat> uh, on nuclear delivery systems and the President's commitment to missile defense. First, we expect to see significant funding for the next generation nuclear ballistic missile submarine and follow-on heavy bomber, which the administration now seems to support, though it hasn't yet confirmed that the U.S. intends the bomber to be capable of a nuclear standoff mission, as well as a final decision that the follow-on to the air-launched cruise missile will be nuclear capable. Finally, we expect to see greater clarity with respect to the administration's intention to maintain the ICBM leg of the triad after the Minuteman III reaches the end of its life. I would expect the administration's commitment to these delivery platforms 
to become increasingly evident in the Defense Department's 2012 budget request, as promised in the update to the Section 1251 report. Modernization of the delivery platforms must parallel the commitment to the nuclear weapons. To continue to use Mrs. Scott Muller's formulation, this is another marching order from the Senate for the administration. The President made clear his commitment to missile defense during the course of the Senate's consideration of the New START Treaty, as I mentioned before. In his December 18 letter to Senators Reed and McConnell, he wrote, and I quote, as long as I am President and as long as the Congress provides the necessary funding, the United States will continue to develop and deploy effective missile defenses to protect the United States, our deployed forces, and our allies and partners, end of quote. The President reiterated what the Senate made clear in the resolution of ratification, that the New START Treaty places no limitations on the development and deployment of our missile defense programs. And he stated that he will take every action available to me to support the deployment of all four phases of the planned missile defense uh, deployments in Europe. The Secretary of Defense also indicated during a Senate Armed Services Committee hearing on December 17th that the Department was looking at an increase in missile defense funding for the fiscal year 2012. <clears throat> As I said before, however, initial press reports hint that the Department of Defense is anticipating a reduction in funding for missile defense over the next five years. Any cut to the missile defense budget would be especially shocking in light of President Obama's commitments to the Senate. Likewise, it would be absolutely indefensible in view of Secretary Gates's recent comment that North Korea was within five years of being able to strike the United States with an intercontinental ballistic missile, and that with North Korea's continuing development of nuclear weapons, North Korea is becoming a direct threat to the United States. Indeed, the recent discovery of a clandestine nuclear enrichment site in North Korea raises significant concern about our ability to estimate the pace at which that country is developing nuclear and ballistic missile defense capabilities. And it should make us think twice as well about our estimate of Iranian nuclear and ballistic missile capabilities. Also troubling are recent statements by senior military officials, including the commander of U.S. forces in the Pacific and the director for naval intelligence, suggesting that China's anti-ship ballistic missiles designed to target U.S. aircraft carriers are now nearly operational. This new anti-ship ballistic missile combined with Beijing's current and growing arsenal of short and medium-range ballistic missiles, threatens to alter the strategic balance in Asia by potentially grounding Pacific-based U.S. air forces and sinking U.S. ships out to a range of 1,000 nautical miles, not to mention the ability to strike U.S. allies and friends in the region. Well, Mr. President, in conclusion, <clears throat> the Russian parliament provided its interpretation of the treaty and preamble in its federal law on ratification. And it is clearly at odds with the Senate's resolution of ratification in several key respects, including missile defense and conventional prompt global strike. To say that their interpretation is not legally binding on the United States is to miss the point, which is, as many of us said during the debate on New START, that because there is no meeting of the minds on these matters, the potential for disputes and increasing tension between the two sides is likely. What was to serve as a vehicle for reset may in fact serve to promote increasing discord. In fact, the first indication of this may have occurred last week when the U.S. and its NATO partners met with Russia to find common ground on missile defense cooperation. In advance of that meeting, the Russian parliament threatened either we agree to certain principles with NATO, and I'm quoting now, or we fail to agree, and then in the future we are forced to adopt an entire series of unpleasant decisions concerning the deployment of an offensive nuclear missile group." End of quote. If this is the language of reset, I wonder what the tone might have been had we not agreed to New START. As it turns out, Russia appears to have rejected the NATO approach. So, Mr. President, we will watch carefully to ensure that the administration fulfills what we have requested. It fulfills the 10-year commitment to nuclear modernization, starting in the 2012 budget request, and that nuclear reductions called for under the New START Treaty do not outpace the commitments to modernization. We must make certain, too, that the administration modernizes our national missile defense system, 
to stay ahead of increasing threats, and it provides the necessary direction and funding to ensure full, timely deployment of missile defense assets in Europe to address the growing Iranian threat, and directs the Missile Defense Agency to develop defensive countermeasures to the anti-ship ballistic missile capability of China. And finally, we must resurrect the Reagan vision of defense, defensive missile defense capabilities based in space, which is the only true effective means for protecting the nation and its deployed forces. Mr. President. The Senator from Alabama. Mr. President, I would like to ask consent that I be allowed to speak for up to 15 minutes. Without objection. Mr. President, I first would like to thank my colleague, Senator Kyle, who uh, is, I think, this body's premier student of the nuclear strategic posture of the United States. I serve and have served as chairman of that subcommittee of armed services, and I share his concerns. I'm thankful that he's here that he's keeping up with these matters year after year. Um, and uh, most of us would rather not talk about them, but they represent serious responsibilities of a great nation who must be able to defend itself, to be able to live freely and prosperously. So I thank the, the senator for sharing those remarks and uh, value his friendship and enjoy following his leadership. Mr. President, uh, last week the Congressional Budget Office issued a report that our Congressional Budget Office, the, uh, the leadership selected by the majority in the Congress, the Democratic majority, and that report showed that our deficit for this year that will end September 30th will be $1.5 trillion. That's the largest deficit the nation has ever had. The last two years have been $1.3, $1.2 trillion. And uh, this one is projected to come in at $1.5. We, we complained, I've complained, that President Bush spent more money than he should, but his highest deficit was one-third of that, $450 billion uh, the year before. Uh, uh, so we are at unprecedented levels of annual deficit and debt. Our gross debt, the total debt of the United States, internal and external, uh, will equal by the end of the year 100 percent of GDP. Annual interest payments we borrow money, people loan us their money, we give them treasury bills and bonds in exchange, and we pay them interest on the debt. Our interest, the amount of interest we pay, will rise to $750 billion by the end of this decade, meaning that a one-year interest payment will cost us nearly as much as 20 years of current highway construction spending. We spend about $40 billion a year, for example, on federal highway expenditures. We're talking about a debt going from $170 or so billion interest payment of $170 billion or so a couple of years ago to $750 because our debt will triple in that time from $5 trillion to over $15 trillion. The total amount of interest we expect to pay between now and the end of the decade is $5.5 trillion in interest, enough money to fund our entire government for 18 months. The situation is so serious that former Federal Reserve Chairman Alan Greenspan warned very recently that we may face a bond market crisis in the next two to three years. He said, it's a little better than 50-50 chance that won't happen, but not much better, was his comment. CBO Director Doug Elmendorf testified last week before the Budget Committee, where I'm ranking member, uh, that we were entering, quote, unfamiliar territory for all developed 
nations over the last several decades, close quote. Unfamiliar territory. He's talking about financially. Debt is what he's talking about. Analysts with the Standard & Poor's stated that, quote, absent a credible plan, the rating on the U.S. government will come under pressure, close quote. In other words, the rating on our debt, will it cease to be AAA? And if that happens, won't our interest rates that I've just been suggesting are, are threatening us, those interest rates will go up because if our ratings go down, people will demand a higher interest before they'll loan us, loan us money. What, and the International Monetary Fund urged the United States to take much stronger action. This is the Washington uh, Post business page just a few days ago. U.S. must reduce deficit, IMF warns. Must reduce deficit, IMF warns. They claim to be, they're not perfect, of course, they claim to be the conscience of the world and warn profligate nations to get their houses in order before it creates systemic problems for other nations and themselves. This article says, quote, European countries have begun a pointed dialogue with their residents about what government can and cannot afford. Move to cut public salaries, trim services, and curb public pensions have touched off strikes and protest, but also put the deficits of those countries on what seems to be a securely downward path, the IMF said. Those are the choices the United States has been hesitant to make, close quote. Two prominent economists, Professor Carmen Reinhart, who's testified before our committee, I think more than once, and uh, uh, Dr. Kenneth Rogoff, issued a paper explaining the negative impact of excessive debt on economic growth. Actually wrote a book. This time it's different. They studied in the last 200 years the countries that have had their economies collapse as a result of debt. A lot of the South American countries have had it various times, uh, Argentina and others. Uh, and they caution that there is a point beyond which you do not want to go. And that point is when, 90, when your debt equals 90% of your economy, 90% of GDP. That's a very respected study. First time anyone's ever studied economies that have had economic collapse. And this is a key factor in that. We're now at 94% of GDP, uh, and by the end of the year, the CBO projects we'll be at 100% of GDP. Our debt will equal 100% of the entire uh, goods and services produced in this uh, economy. So our nation is on a dangerous and is everybody that we've had who've testified before the committee and virtually anybody that's expressed themselves, they call it an unsustainable path. The president said, we're on an unsustainable path. So we need strong leadership from our president. The day before his State of the Union, I wrote an op-ed, it's published in the Washington Post. I called on him to present a broad vision for reducing spending. I said that, quote, his proposals cannot be timid, close quote, and that this was, quote, a defining moment for his presidency. I have to say he did not rise to that occasion. Instead of a bold vision, he put forward a meek plan to continue spending at current levels for five more years, calling that a freeze, but we've had a surge in spending the last two years. Freezing at that level cannot be acceptable. These are the levels that produced the $1.5 trillion deficit. So the president's speech, I must say, was disconnected I say with care from reality. He nowhere in that speech entered into a dialogue with the American people about the severity of the crisis we face. 
or made any attempt to call on them in a serious way to understand why it is that we can't continue at this level of spending. He failed to present a credible uh, plan. So this is what the Washington Post said in an, in an editorial yesterday. They weren't mean-spirited about it, but you could tell they were very disappointed. They said this, quote, in his State of the Union address Tuesday night, President Obama failed to present a credible plan for long-term debt reduction. It's no secret we think he made a big mistake. If America can't get a handle on its finances, everything else is at risk, close quote. But not only has the president failed to lead with ideas, he has set about to thwart, to block others from taking action. This is a, a concerning to me. This Sunday at one of the big news programs, his new chief of staff, Bill Daly, balked at a Republican plan to cut spending for the rest of the year. Daly said any budget cuts must be paired with new spending, quote, investments, close quote, as he and the president called them. He taunted the Republicans, I think, with, where's the beef? Let's see the cuts they're talking about, close quote. So the president refuses to lead and then sends his emissaries to attack any Republican who makes a serious program. I assume is being heartless, kind, wanting to throw children in the streets, as, and so forth. For instance, the president's chief economic advisor, Austin Goolsby, lashed out at Republicans for wanting to reduce discretionary spending before we raise the debt ceiling. I mean, we have to have some sort of bipartisan agreement before we agree to raise this debt ceiling that we're going to reduce some of the spending. Clip back on the credit card a little bit, something significant. The President's own Secretary of Treasury, Tim Geithner, recently argued that it was too early to begin cutting the deficits. Yeah, it's unsustainable. Yeah, we're, it's unsustainable, but it's too early to start cutting now. Maybe 2012? After that, maybe? Geithner's comments ring all too similar to those of his predecessor, Hank Paulson. Secretary of Treasury on the President Bush, who said that the housing downturn was under control before the Wall Street firms began falling like dominoes. But ignoring the reality of our situation does not change it. The money simply isn't there to support the President's spending agenda that he announced at the State of the Union. We don't have the money. Our nation cannot afford another era of big government. In two weeks, on February 14th, just two weeks from now, the President will submit a new budget to Congress. It will go to our committee, the Budget Committee. This may be, and I say this seriously, his last chance to get it right, for the President to be a credible voice in this debate. And he must put forward a budget that significantly lowers spending levels. He cannot present Congress with the same unserious plan he presented last Tuesday night. Three years into his term, I think this budget that he'll be submitting is a defining act of what he views and how he views the debt we face. I think if uh, this budget fails to meet the necessary demands for curtailing spending, we will know pretty conclusively where the president is. You know, numbers count. You can have rhetoric and we can disagree, but at some point you have to put out your budget that says what you're going to do how much you're going to spend, and where you're going to get the money. In this case, where, how much are we going to borrow to carry on the government at that time? And so we're going to see whether the president is moving uh, with the American people to fiscal and economic sanity, 
or whether or not he will continue uh, his ideological commitment to big government. I think that's it. I think we'll know in two weeks. That's a serious matter. So I think we need to turn back from the cliff toward which we are heading and get on a new road. We need to reduce both the size of the deficit and we'll have to reduce the size of the government somewhat. We're not going to sink into the ocean. We go back to 2008, 2006 levels of federal spending. Will the country collapse? Give me a break. Certainly it's not going to collapse, but it'll put us on a road to fiscal sanity. It will restore not only public confidence in our economy, but it will really restore the foundations of American prosperity. I truly believe one of the clouds over the American economy is the perception, unfortunately too true, that we're spending at a reckless rate, that we are irresponsibly running up debt that could cause us to inflate the value of our currency, that could cause a debt crisis, as Mr. Greenspan said, was almost a 50-50 chance in the next two to three years. And if you've got money to invest, where does that, what does that say to you? Maybe you better sit back and, and see a little bit more until we get this debt that's spiraling out of control, under control, heading on a downward path toward a balanced budget, we're not going to see the economic growth that's possible. I don't know uh, how... Uh, I, I think that's where we should be heading. So strong, sustained reductions in spending will not be easy. It'll take us down a tough road, but it's the only road, the only course that will lead to a better financial future for ourselves and our children and preserve the integrity of the United States economy uh, in a way that uh, is necessary for growth to occur. I thank the chair and would yield the floor and note the absence of a quorum. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Akaka.
We're bringing you live coverage from the floor of the U.S. Senate. Came back into session for morning hour today. No roll call votes are expected. And uh, on cspan.org, you can catch an earlier White House briefing with Press Secretary Robert Gibbs. From the White House today, President Obama's ambassador to China, a possible presidential challenger in 2012, says he's uh, leaving his post there in China. And much of today's White House briefing had to do with questions on Egypt. In Egypt, the army is admitting the legitimacy of protesters' demands there. The country's military says it promised to guarantee freedom of expression ahead of a planned escalation of the anti-government protests. And a military spokesman in Egypt appeared on state TV saying that the military has not and will not use force against protesters there as the anti-government protests continue. But he did urge them not to commit acts harming security or damaging property. And meanwhile, the Cairo airport was a scene of chaos, foreigners trying to leave Egypt. And countries around the world are scrambling to send in planes to fly their citizens out. As the AP reports, with frayed nerves there, shouting and shoving matches erupted, as thousands of people crammed into Cairo's airport. Just some of the latest word on the situation in Egypt.
We're bringing you live coverage from the floor of the Senate, which came back into session today for morning hour. They're in a quorum call now. No roll call votes are expected. Over on our companion network, C-SPAN, you can catch our conversation with George W. Bush from Q&A. And on C-SPAN 3, a discussion on possible policies and guidelines for Pakistan's future. Earlier today, we heard from the White House during a briefing with Press Secretary Robert Gibbs. On the situation in Egypt, the White House called for free and fair elections today, but refused to say whether the U.S. believes President Hosni Mubarak should run. White House spokesman Gibbs dismissed Mr. Mubarak's move to appoint a new government, saying the situation in Egypt calls for action, not appointments. As the Associated Press reports, the posts are seen by some as an attempt to defuse the political upheaval there. Tens of thousands of demonstrators have been flooding the streets, calling for President Mubarak to resign. You can see the White House briefing on cspan.org.
live here on C-SPAN 2 or on the floor of the U.S. Senate, which is in a quorum call. Majority Leader Harry Reid says they could take up reauthorization of the Federal Aviation Administration sometime this week. And no roll call votes are expected in the Senate today. The House is out for the week. Members will reconvene next Tuesday. And you can catch the House live on our companion network, C-SPAN. We're going to show you while we're in this quorum call some of today's White House briefing with Press Secretary Robert Gibbs. Mr. Fowler. Thanks, Robert. A few questions on Egypt. Um, a broad one to start. Since the crisis began, um, a couple of the central questions have been whether President Mubarak should stay in power, and if so, whether he has the capacity to uh, put in place these reforms that the people of Egypt want and the White House wants. Mm -hmm. Can you explain why on those two fronts the White House is not taking a position? Uh, well, Ben, it is not uh, for up to us to determine uh, when the grievances of the Egyptian people have been met by the Egyptian government. Um, we have said all along uh, that um, there are, as I mentioned, legitimate uh, concerns and grievances had by the Egyptian people uh, for a long time. Uh, the need for uh, freedom to associate, freedom to communicate over the internet, uh, freedom to assemble, the freedom of speech, uh, and that those must be addressed in a substantive way uh, by the Egyptian government. Uh, but we're not picking between those on the street and those in the government. As the Secretary of State said yesterday, we're for and have enumerated uh, our concern uh, for the people of Egypt. You say that it's up to the Egyptian people. Is it fair and accurate to say that it is the stand of the White House that you do not want any kind of transition to be through the toppling of an existing head of state? It should be the well, resignation or election? Let me be clear, because I'm not going to get into a series of, of hypotheticals. I think you heard yesterday uh, very clearly the Secretary of State say uh, that there must be an orderly transition, um, that a whole range of issues, some which I just talked about, have to be addressed, that there has to be uh, meaningful negotiations with a broad cross-section of the Egyptian people, uh, including opposition groups. Um, that that go to answering the very core uh, of the freedoms that people desire. We've talked about those, and the, you've heard the president speak in Cairo about them. Uh, free and fair elections uh, in September uh, for the presidency and for the parliament. Uh, constitutional changes that facilitate a more open and more democratic process. These are some of the things that. Uh, <coughs> that I know we've spoken uh, directly with uh, with the Egyptians about. Two others on this, please. Mm -hmm. The September elections you just referenced, is it the preference of the U.S. government that Mubarak not run again? And it's not. The United States government does not determine uh, who's on the ballot. The question is whether or not those elections are going to be free and fair. That's that's what we, uh, we would weigh in on uh, and weigh in on strongly. And of all these changes that you talked about that the U.S. government wants, can you give us some more detail, perhaps from over the weekend or today, about what the government is doing to help make it happen as opposed to just calling for it? Well, look, uh, I, I'm going to let you report on that. I, I will say this. Uh, the, the, as you, I think, know, the president was briefed um, uh, on uh, the very latest, including readouts from our embassy and from our ambassador yesterday. Uh, our national security advisor held a call with some principals this morning. The president was briefed on uh, the latest developments as a, as a part of, uh, as quite frankly, the most of his uh, uh, daily intelligence briefing. Uh, the uh, deputies committee, there's now sort of a standing morning meeting on, uh, on the situation. Uh, that was had uh, later this morning, uh, and the president's receiving updates uh, regularly out of that. Um, you know, but this is not about um, this is not about appointments. This is about actions. Uh, 
uh, that's what uh, I think people here and people around the world need to see uh, from uh, from the Egyptian government. Yes, sir. Thank you. Robert, can you define what you mean by an orderly transition? Well, uh, many of the things I just talked about, Jeff. I, I, I talked about uh, a uh, <coughs> transition has to include uh, an orderly transition has to include a process um, of negotiations with a broad cross section of the Egyptian people, including those that are in the political opposition at the moment. With the current government? Uh, well, I mean, I don't think the grievances are going to be met unless there's some measure of, uh, of, uh, of that involved. Um, they have to address the freedoms that, uh, that the people of Egypt seek. Uh, and as I said a minute ago, many of the things that, uh, that we've outlined over the course of the past many days uh, have to be included. Free, again, free and fair elections. We've talked about the emergency law. Uh, again, changes in the Constitution that facilitate uh, a more open and democratic process. All of those things uh, are what must happen in the country uh, in order to transition to something that is more democratic. Do you believe President Mubarak is doing that now? Are you happy with his response so Again, far? I think this is not about appointments, it's about actions. Do you see the actions uh, that you're looking for? Well, I, I, I think it is obvious that uh, uh, there's more work to be done. Uh, I think that is obvious uh, in the pictures that we continue to see from Cairo. Do you, what role should the military be playing in this? Well, I, I you look, we have had a, I should say this too, the, the, there's a, obviously a, a number of calls and contacts that happen uh, between our government and counterparts in the Egyptian government. We are thus far um, uh, pleased at the restraint that has taken place uh, and encourage that uh, even as we see reports of increased participation tomorrow uh, by protesters that uh, calm and nonviolence once again carry the day um, on both sides. So uh, it, it, again, it's, it's our belief that first and foremost this has to be uh, this has to be something that's conducted with uh, uh, through nonviolence. Yes, sir. Has anybody in the administration been in contact with Mohammed al Uh Obviously, the embassy is, has been in touch with him in the past. Uh, I think he is somebody, along with uh, a whole host of people um, uh, in uh, uh, non governmental voices, uh, in uh, whether they're opposition political uh, parties or whether they're uh, heads of business or banks uh, that we are regularly in touch with. I, I believe that uh, they will continue to reach out to people uh, like him and to a whole host of figures, uh, again, non-governmental and civil society figures, to have a discussion with them about what Egypt must do and what Egypt must look like. Has the embassy been in touch with him in the last week? Uh, not that I'm aware of, uh, at least when I came in here. Would it make sense for somebody to be in touch with him? Uh, I, I, again, I, I think that outreach is on <coughs> um, The Egyptian government in the past has conveyed to the Obama administration and to previous administrations that it, it suspects that, it's demo that the democracy push from the U.S. Uh, <laughs> might result in, a, in something along the lines of what we've seen in Gaza and that is an Islamist uh, group uh, being elected and, and gaining power, in this case, uh, the Muslim Brotherhood. How much does the Obama administration agree with that assessment? Well, look, Jake, I, I think that, uh, as I said here last week, I think that it is, uh, from, from what we can see, it's not accurate to say that uh, those protesting are made up of one particular group or one ideology. Um, and uh, I think it is clear that that uh, increase in democratic representation uh, has to include um, a whole host of uh, 
uh, important non-secular uh, uh, actors that uh, that give Egypt uh, uh, a strong chance to continue uh, to be the stable uh, and reliable partner that the world sees in the Middle East. Al Baradai uh, told uh, ABC News this weekend that uh, the Muslim Brotherhood is, is no more extremist, is not an extremist organization, uh, and is no different from uh, Orthodox Jews in Israel or Evangelical Christians in the United States. Does the Obama administration agree with that? Well, I, let me, uh, without getting into a discussion about them, I think there are certain standards that we believe uh, everybody should adhere to as being part of this process. One that is, to participate in this ongoing democratic process, one has to take part in it, but not use it as a way of uh, simply becoming, um, uh, simply becoming, or taking over that process, simply to put themselves in power. We believe uh, that I any group should uh, strongly weigh in on the side of nonviolence uh, and adherence to the law. Yes. Sir. Orderly transition means change. So, by by using those words, is the administration not admitting that President Mubarak should leave? Again, Dan, that's, that is, uh, I do believe orderly transition means change. And what we've advocated from the very beginning uh, is that uh, the way Egypt looks and operates must change. That's, uh, that's why we believe we should increase the amount of freedom that is had by the Egyptian people uh, on association, on assembly, on speech, on internet, and com open communication. Uh, but that's not for us to determine what the parameters and what the limits of those are. Uh, but undoubtedly, uh, undoubtedly, transition in this case means change. So there's the there's no doubt are, about that. If he's the leader, though, are you not saying that he should be changed or removed from office by saying that? No, again, Dan, that, that, is, not for, uh, that is not for our country uh, or our government to determine. I don't think that people that seek greater freedom are looking for somebody else to pick uh, what and how that change looks like. That's, that, that is, quite frankly, uh, th that doesn't adhere in any way to uh, an open democratic process uh, that allows for a full discussion and negotiation about what that freedom looks like. Freedom of many of the freedoms I just talked about, but greater economic opportunity, greater economic freedoms. That's not for us to determine. But the White House has really been ramping up its, its focus on innovation and jobs. It was a big uh, event today as well. Mm -hmm. uh, does what is happening in <coughs> Egypt distract at all from that push? No, not at all. I, the, the weather permitting, the president's uh, uh, planning to go later this week to Pennsylvania uh, and, uh, and continue our push on innovation. Uh, uh, we, will, uh, we will continue. Uh, we will continue to work through uh, all of that. I don't, you know, I I events uh, happen that any administration and any government have to respond to, uh, but at the same time, uh, much as we dealt with over the previous two years, uh, you, uh, you have to deal with many things uh, happening at once, and uh, that's what this administration continues to do. One final question. Mm -hmm. um, the President obviously is getting a lot of updates from his national security team, but is he also bringing in outside advisors to, to help him? Well, uh, uh, the, the National Security uh, uh, Council has regular outreach to, uh, uh, to experts around the country. Uh, I, I know they had some folks in here earlier today to talk about Egypt as part of that regular process. Uh, and, and I don't doubt that, uh, again, at many levels of our government, uh, we are talking to uh, uh, many people with uh, insights into, uh, uh, into Egypt. What were some of those people who came into it? Uh, I, I, we can get you a list of, uh, of all those folks. Um, Robert, um, the President's schedule is clear today, public schedule is clear today. Did he clear that schedule so that he could deal with this? No. that's. Uh, uh, again, he, he's gotten, uh, as far as I know, uh, as of uh, as of right now, there's been, uh, you know, he's been briefed as part of the PDB uh, on what's happened and on the discussions that have happened uh, 
at a pr at a principal's and at a deputy's level, uh, but I don't. Uh, there's nothing that I know that's been added to his schedule as a result of uh, uh, what's going on over the so weekend. He's not monitoring, monitoring this constantly. He's working on a lot of other. He's so. working on a lot of stuff, but I will say this, Chip. Obviously, he's. We give him updates as uh, as the situation. Uh, as the situation dictates. Would you suspect we'll hear from him again sometime in the next uh, few days as this goes uh, on? I mean, again, I think that depends on uh, on uh, some of what happens on the ground. Um, you said that, that this transition does not mean that Mubarak would have to go and that. No, no, uh, no. no, no. I, I want to be clear. I, I want I want to be very clear because I don't. Uh, that is not for me to determine. That is not for our government to determine. That is for the people of Egypt to determine. So uh, I have. Uh, I have not weighed in on anything other than uh, on, as we have throughout this process, on the side of uh, the people of Egypt to determine uh, what Egypt looks like in their future. Right, but my question is, are you categorically saying that at no time will the president ever say it's time for him well, to go? <laughs> I'm not, uh, Chip, I, I'm not going to stand up here and, uh, and, 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 uh, and look that far into the future, and it may, and not, it may be a few days in the future. It sounds like you're I, leaving I, the door open to the possibility. <laughs> no, no. Some point. I, I appreciate the game we're playing. Uh, I, I'm, I'm, I, I'd, I'd rather you not put words in my mouth in either of the three questions that get asked. Well, uh, one other thing: are, oh. are there discussions going on about the, the, the possibility, the worries <laughs> that this could spread uh, in the Middle East? Well, I, I, look, I think we're, it is safe to say that uh, what we saw in uh, happened in Tunisia, uh, uh, we saw, certainly had the capabilities to go uh, in other countries. I, I wouldn't generalize, as I said last week, across the spectrum of, com uh, of countries in this region or outside this region because e each country is different. And